thanks again for joining us for this edition of the 2014 Campaign Roundtable Series. I'm politics reporter Rob Rizzuto, and we are here today with the three Democratic candidates running to be the next Lieutenant Governor of Massachusetts. Again, gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we are going to shift gears a little bit and uh, go right into the political side of things. Um, although you've each been very busy hitting the campaign trail uh, with your own political ambitions, I imagine you've been watching the governor's race. Um, you know, on the Democratic side, we've had uh, Martha Coakley and Steve Grossman tangling it up, um, getting very heated at times between the two. Um, meanwhile, Don Berwick has uh, been working very hard to build a statewide profile. Um, you know, all three have pointed out their differences between them and uh, the likely Republican gubernatorial nominee, Charlie Baker. Um, but as you're watching the governor's campaign, um, you know, what's, uh, what's your reaction to the way things have been going, uh, perhaps on the Democratic side? And is there any one candidate that you are hoping to uh, be, have the chance to serve with? And uh, for this one, we will start with Leland. Yeah, uh, well, they're like my children. I love them all equally, but in different <laughs> ways. Uh, and since I only have, my wife and I only have one daughter, uh, it really is equally. Uh, I'm confident, I've known uh, Steve Grossman and Martha Coakley and Dom, I went to school with Don Berg's son, I know them all. And I'm confident that no matter who is the, uh, is the gubernatorial nominee and whoever is our next governor, I'll be able to work with them and they'll be excited to use the skill sets and expertise and passion that I bring to the job. Uh, when, our, when we recently had our city manager retire after 30 some odd years, he was going around the room and saying, you know, you've been a leader on this, you've been a leader on this. Leland, I don't have enough time to go into everything you've worked on. Uh, but that's the kind of passion I want to bring to the governor's, the lieutenant governor's office and work with the governor on. Uh, so I'm confident that they'll be able to, they've all talked about the prioritization of investing in education, investing in infrastructure, and having somebody on their team whose focus is just that, bringing long-term attention to issues of consequence to the Commonwealth is, is something that they'd, they'd welcome. So a fan of all three, not uh, singly <laughs> on any particular one. All right, uh, Mike. I'm, I'm imagining you're, you're going to get something similar <laughs> from all of us. Um, I'm fishing here. But the, the truth of the matter is I think we have three extraordinary candidates running in the Democratic field. Um, each one of them brings something uh, different to the table, but something critical to the future of Massachusetts. I mean, you have uh, Don Berwick, who's been talking about implementing single-payer health care, Medicare for all, right here in Commonwealth, being, again, being a leader in this nation. Uh, with health care expenses now representing more than 40 percent of our state budget and single payer reducing those expenses by approximately a third, that's a serious impact you can have. You have Attorney General Coakley who's been talking about investing in mental health services. You know, Massachusetts has decreased its investment in mental health services more so than any other New England state. And then you have Treasurer Grossman who's been talking about economic development, creating jobs in the Commonwealth. And I believe we need to create jobs, but not just any job. We need to create jobs that pay a livable wage. So as I tell people when I do get this question, if you put all three of them together, you end up with me. <laughs> so I'd be happy to work with any of them. And uh, I know that uh, what I bring to the table will not only strengthen our ticket come November, but will strengthen the administration for the next four years and, and hopefully beyond. And Steve, uh, you know, looking at the governor's race, you know, what's your reaction? Is there any one candidate that uh, stands out to you? Love to serve alongside with? You know, I've gone. I've been campaigning around this uh, Commonwealth for 19 months, and I now have 11 days uh, to avoid that question. So I'm going <laughs> to I'm going to keep doing that um, as best I can. We've got look. Everything that these guys said is true. You know, we've got three extraordinary candidates. Uh, I've been honored to know Steve. Uh, Grossman, since he was state party chair when I was working for Senator Kennedy, I got to know Martha uh, when she was district attorney and I was in the AG's office, and uh, and I, I knew Don's reputation more before the campaign uh, through uh, my work in the Obama uh, world, uh, and he's a, an extraordinary uh, public servant. And so uh, the, the bottom line is uh, for the people here in Massachusetts is that whoever we nominate, uh, any one of those three would be a far better uh, governor for Massachusetts uh, than Charlie Baker would be. Uh, and, uh, and the ticket that we put together uh, will be far better than a Charlie Baker, Karen Polito ticket because they, we have the right priorities. The Democratic Party, our priorities are Massachusetts priorities. You know, Charlie Baker started uh, the gutting of DCF and DTA when he was uh, Health and Human Services Secretary under Governor Weld in 1992. Um, when he was done with that, when slashing uh, programs like that, he moved on to the Big Dig Financing Plan when he was ANF Secretary, which left communities like Springfield and a lot of Western Mass and where I'm from in Central Mass 
uh, dry when it came to transportation infrastructure funding. Uh, we need a governor uh, who understands those issues. We also need a lieutenant governor who understands uh, that we've got to keep to the promises that we've made to people. Karen Polito's number one initiative when she was in the House of Representatives was to move state and municipal pensions to 401k plans. Thank God it, it was defeated uh, because those folks who work in, in the public sector uh, deserve us to fulfill the commitment that they made to us. We have to uh, fulfill our end of the bargain. The same goes, by the way, with private sector workers on Social Security and our federal partners to make sure that the commitment we make to people uh, that we live up to our end of the bargain. That's what people want out of government. They want government to do what they say they're going to do, and they want government to believe in them and the sacrifices that they make. We'll do that as Democrats uh, in November and leading again in January. Gotcha. All right. So uh, nobody's singling out any one of the candidates. Uh, Matt Fenlon over at the uh, Massachusetts Democratic Party, I'm sure thanks you. <laughs> uh, but we are getting close to uh, the end of our show here today. So um, what we'd like to do, touch on in, in conclusion here is um, the actual role of Lieutenant Governor. Um, this position has been vacant for over a year now since uh, Tim Murray stepped down. Um, some people say that we don't even need the position in Massachusetts anymore. Uh, but each of you have had your own respective pitches to modernize this position, to take the job of lieutenant governor into the future, into 2014. Um, so just explain to the voters you know, what it is about your vision that makes you the best candidate to take this job into the 21st century. And uh, Mike, we could start with you on this one. Right, well, thank you. And thank you again for this opportunity. Um, Look, I, I see that the Lieutenant Governor's Office's greatest asset is the flexibility it has by not having a well-defined job description by our Constitution. You see, it's the one constitutional office that therefore has the flexibility to change and adjust to meet the needs of the times. The needs of the 21st century are drastically different than the 18th century when John Adams wrote our Constitution. So think about some of those needs. The challenges of the 21st century will be resolved, or most of them will be resolved at the local level. I will be a lieutenant governor who partners with our local leaders in every co corner of the Commonwealth. In fact, I've made a pledge to visit every city and town in Massachusetts in my first term. Um, I also believe that the lieutenant governor should be a liaison to our legislators, because that's how we build the relationships between the executive and legislative branches to really get the job done, to, r to support the people in, in our communities. And finally, I believe that the lieutenant governor should be a liaison to the world outside of Massachusetts. We have an opportunity to bring jobs, as I said before, to Massachusetts. We have the talent and we have the infrastructure, although we need to increase our investment in transportation, create regional equity in Massachusetts. Um, and the lieutenant governor can be a voice for that effort. I see that. Um, I'm the only candidate that, that has had the experience of working at the local, state, national, and international levels. The only candidate has worked in the private, public, nonprofit, and academic sectors. Uh, but don't take my word on my qualifications. The only three-term governor of Massachusetts, Governor Michael Dukakis, has endorsed me in this race. Now, there's a man who's qualified to say who the next best lieutenant governor will be. I'm proud that he chose me, and I hope the viewers here today will do the same on September 9th. Mike, thank you. Um, Leland. Your vision for this office and taking it into the 21st century. Yeah. What makes you the best candidate for the next for the job of lieutenant governor? Again, I have a website, LelandChung.com, <laughs> where I've outlined my vision. But you know, I, the, my favorite show is Undercover Boss, and I don't think Governor Patrick has been lacking in terms of vision or progressive values. Uh, but so, frankly, some of the missteps have been embarrassing for the state. And the governor is like the CEO. The legislature does the budget. They're like the CFO. What we need is a COO, a chief operating officer of the Commonwealth. That's what I'm proposing the lieutenant governor be. Uh, undercover boss, you know, the, the people have seen the show. They go undercover. They think that the issue is with their employees. Inevitably, they discover the issues with the policies that they put in place. I want to work at the front lines, working with our administration, help, that's delivering services to residents, working at the grassroots, helping build coalitions to get things through the legislature. Uh, and that's why I want to establish satellite, satellite offices of the executive branch in all of our metro areas, uh, in every corner of the Commonwealth, in our gateway cities, and not just visit, this, visit the cities, but actually spend time there and personally staff them. Living so close to Beacon Hill as I do, it's easy for me to commute against traffic uh, and to go outwards to the, to the corners of the Commonwealth and be there so that I'm not, I'm not just representing people on Beacon Hill, but bringing Beacon Hill to you. So that's my vision of the Lieutenant Governor's role and the value it can add uh, to the constitutional offices. So thank you for the question. Thank you, Leland. Steve, uh, taking this job into the 21st century, sure. what's, uh, what makes you the best candidate? 
Well, you know, I'm, I've said from the beginning of this campaign, you know, I am, I'm running to get government back in the business of solving problems. It's what I've been honored enough uh, in my entire career to do uh, in every uh, job I've had, whether it was a selectman or a finance committee member dealing with the issues in, in our town in Lancaster and, and our region, uh, or in the AG's office working right here in Springfield where we had an office uh, and still do working on many of the consumer protection cases we, we fought here in Springfield uh, on the, uh, the illegal gun pipeline that was coming into Massachusetts that we worked on tirelessly and needs to still be worked on. Uh, here in Massachusetts, or when I worked for Senator Kennedy, uh, when we fought for funding with Congressman Neal, our good friend, uh, for the, not just the Basketball Hall of Fame, for, but for community development uh, and investment right here, uh, right here in the West. Um, and you know, that's what I want to do as Lieutenant Governor. You know, th those who say um, there is, there may not be a need for Lieutenant Governor's office. I, you know, as a former elected, uh, local elected official, and someone who has had the support of 17 mayors in this campaign, uh, I say call them. Talk to them about it. Talk to folks in cities and towns about what they are missing. Uh, they used to have a liaison that could pick up the telephone and call uh, to work through the morass of state government to get things done for their community. Uh, talk to also uh, veteran service agents. Uh, you know, I chair a small uh, nonprofit called the Mass Military Heroes Fund that supports families of fallen service members from all across Massachusetts. We worked almost weekly with Tim Murray's office uh, on issues facing our families and the families of, of veterans and wounded warriors. Uh, again, almost weekly, and, and we miss that. You know, Coleman Nee, the secretary, has done an amazing job. Uh, but when you have an issue that crosses agencies and, and departments, you need someone who can lead and help uh, the governor, governor lead this commonwealth. And, and uh, that's why I want to serve really as an ombudsman uh, for state government. I want to be the person that folks can go to, uh, whether they be in the business community or in the nonprofit world or in government itself, uh, to get things done. And I want to work with all of our partners in the legislature. I think the, sometimes the biggest aisle to cross uh, in politics when I worked in Washington, it was between the Democrats and the Republicans, and still is. Uh, but I think here it's between the governor's office and the, the legislature. Uh, and that's what I look forward to working with uh, the over 50 legislators uh, who've endorsed my campaign and many more uh, to really get things done for the people of Massachusetts. So I look forward to it and hope to, uh, we can have uh, uh, the strong showing on September 9th and be a part of the ticket on November 4th. So, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and to all the candidates, Steve Kerrigan, Mike Lake, Leland Chung, thank you very much and best of luck on uh, Democratic Primary Day. Thank, thank you, you, Rob. Thanks a lot. And uh, I would also like to thank our panel of journalists, Ron Chamellis and Rob Janess. Gentlemen, thank you very much for coming through today. Thank you. And last but certainly not least, we'd like to thank you, the readers, the viewers, the listeners, for taking the time to tune in and listen to the candidates articulate their views on these very important issues this election season. And more important than who you vote for on primary day, which is September 9th, is that you take the time to go out and vote. It is a very important uh, right that you have here, and it cannot be oversold. So take 10 minutes out of your day. Go and vote. Um, and take time to go to the candidates' websites, read news reports, Get your information from a diversity of sources. It's the only way to be truly informed. Uh, but in the meantime, stick with MassLive.com, The Republican, New England Public Radio, and CBS 3 Springfield for the latest on all your election news. And again, thank you very much. This forum and others like it throughout the election season will be available online at CBS3Springfield.com, MassLive.com, and full coverage in the Republican newspaper and on New England Public Radio. Thanks for watching.